God sends men and women for purposes and messages, and the prophet Bishop Clarence C. McLennan was sent with the apostolic and prophetic assignment of being called to the nations with a message. Apostolic and prophetic assignment of Bishop McClendon takes place through regular weekly worship experiences and periodic prophetic encounters of consecutive nights of revelatory teaching, as well as global conferences and crusades. Clarence McClendon Ministries and the Place of Grace are stewarding the apostolic and prophetic call placed upon it by the Father. We are covering the globe with the grace of God, the healing grace of Jesus of Nazareth, and taking the message of the finished work of Jesus to the nations. This assignment is the Academy of Healing and Wellness, which teaches the healing grace of Jesus and includes the instruction of the healing of bodies, lands, and nations, and is broadcast live across the globe. The central nucleus and headquarters for the assignment of the prophet is the Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center. Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center, a learning, training, and sending out center, will be a television-ready studio where content can be captured, produced, and sent out worldwide. Ministry programs like the Alpha Care Program and the Kingdom Life Curriculum, designed to help the sons of God and the systems of the world become effective children of the kingdom. Weekly and holiday ministry food outreaches to the less fortunate in the Los Angeles area, with the Cosmopolitan Center functioning as the headquarters, is an ongoing commitment. Bishop Clarence C. McClendon and the Place of Grace is not a physical location, but a spiritual destination. Become a partner with us today. God sends men and women for purposes and messages, and the prophet Bishop Clarence C. McClendon was sent with the apostolic and prophetic assignment of being called to the nations with a message. Apostolic and prophetic assignment of Bishop McClendon takes place through regular weekly worship experiences and periodic prophetic encounters of consecutive nights of revelatory teaching, as well as global conferences and crusades. Clarence McClendon Ministries and the Place of Grace are stewarding the apostolic and prophetic call placed upon it by the Father. We are covering the globe with the grace of God, the healing grace of Jesus of Nazareth, and taking the message of the finished work of Jesus to the nations. This assignment is the Academy of Healing and Wellness, which teaches the healing grace of Jesus and includes the instruction of the healing of bodies, lands, and nations, and is broadcast live across the globe. The central nucleus and headquarters for the assignment of the prophet is the Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center. Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center, a learning, training, and sending out center, will be a television-ready studio where content can be captured, produced, and sent out worldwide. Ministry programs like the Alpha Care Program and the Kingdom Life Curriculum, designed to help the sons of God and the systems of the world become effective children of the kingdom. 
Weekly and holiday ministry food outreaches to the less fortunate in the Los Angeles area with the Cosmopolitan Center functioning as the headquarters is an ongoing commitment. Bishop Clarence C. McLennan and the Place of Grace is not a physical location, but a spiritual destination. Become a partner with us today. God sends men and women for purposes and messages, and the prophet Bishop Clarence C. McLennan was sent with the apostolic and prophetic assignment of being called to the nations with a message. Apostolic and prophetic assignment of Bishop McClendon takes place through regular weekly worship experiences and periodic prophetic encounters of consecutive nights of revelatory teaching, as well as global conferences and crusades. Clarency McClendon Ministries and the Place of Grace are stewarding the apostolic and prophetic call placed upon it by the Father. We are covering the globe with the grace of God, the healing grace of Jesus of Nazareth, and taking the message of the finished work of Jesus to the nations. A mandate of this assignment is the Academy of Healing and Wellness, which teaches the healing grace of Jesus and includes the instruction of the healing of bodies, lands, and nations, and is broadcast live across the globe. The central nucleus and headquarters for the assignment of the prophet is the Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center. Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center, a learning, training, and sending out center, will be a television-ready studio where content can be captured, produced, and sent out worldwide. Ministry programs like the Alpha Care Program and the Kingdom Life Curriculum, designed to help the sons of God and the systems of the world become effective children of the kingdom. Weekly and holiday ministry food outreaches to the less fortunate in the Los Angeles area with the Cosmopolitan Center functioning as the headquarters is an ongoing commitment. Bishop Clarence C. McClendon and the Place of Grace is not a physical location, but a spiritual destination. Become a partner with us today. God sends men and women for purposes and messages, and the prophet Bishop Clarence C. McClendon was sent with the apostolic and prophetic assignment of being called to the nations with a message. Apostolic and prophetic assignment of Bishop McClendon takes place through regular weekly worship experiences and periodic prophetic encounters of consecutive nights of revelatory teaching, as well as global conferences and crusades. Clarency McClendon Ministries and the Place of Grace are stewarding the apostolic and prophetic call placed upon it by the Father. We are covering the globe with the grace of God, the healing grace of Jesus of Nazareth, and taking the message of the finished work of Jesus to the nations. This assignment is the Academy of Healing and Wellness, which teaches the healing grace of Jesus and includes the instruction of the healing of bodies, lands, and nations, and is broadcast live across the globe. The central nucleus and headquarters for the assignment of the prophet is the Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center.
Place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center, a learning, training, and sending out center, will be a television-ready studio where content can be captured, produced, and sent out worldwide. Ministry programs like the Alpha Care Program and the Kingdom Life Curriculum, designed to help the sons of God and the systems of the world become effective children of the Kingdom. Weekly and holiday ministry food outreaches to the less fortunate in the Los Angeles area, with the Cosmopolitan Center functioning as the headquarters, is an ongoing commitment. Bishop Clarence C. McClendon and the Place of Grace is not a physical location, but a spiritual destination. Become a partner with us today. but stay connected. Listen, connection in this season is one of the most significant things that can happen to all of the sons and daughters of God, no matter where you may be around the world. So let me first of all say welcome to today's session of the Eyes of the Watchman, and let me encourage you that if you are not yet a part of our prophetic e-community, you need to connect and stay connected. doesn't cost you anything. All you've got to do is go to uh, www.bishopmcclendon.com, connect there. And the moment you do, uh, a number of things begin to happen. And I'm serious about it because it's so important. The moment you do, you come under the connection and the covering that's on my life and this ministry. Now, once again, all that means is we begin to pray for you and to begin to extend the grace of God that has been laid upon us to steward uh, to your life. It's very important. Paul, the apostle said, a dispensation of the grace of God has been given to me for you. What does that mean? He's not talking about dispensationalism in the theological sense. He's saying it has been given to me as an apostle, as a prophet of God, Paul was saying, a responsibility to dispense the grace of God that has been given to me for you. See, whenever God places grace on an apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, and on that ministry, that grace is for the people of God. The anointings you connect with, the graces you connect with, the grace on that ministry comes upon your life. And so you need to be connected to several, I'm sure. Maybe you've got a home church, home ministry. That's a significant connection. But then the other connections in the doma giftings of ministry, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, those are important. So go to bishopmcclendon.com and connect with us. The moment you do that, grace comes on you. We begin to pray for you. I also will begin to start sharing with you faith-building letters, prophetic insights from the word of God. They're brief and concise, but each one of them are my words. I edit every single one of them, make sure more than one time that they are concise so that I'm getting to you the essence of it. So don't forget, Go to bishopmcclendon.com today and connect. Don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. If you don't have the Bishop McClendon app, I encourage you to download that today. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. There are so many facets of this ministry uh, through which we are reaching out and we're expanding all the time. And during the course of this session of the Eyes of the Watchman, don't forget to like and share the video Send your prayer requests and your testimonies to us. My prayer ministers are with me live. And once again, in ever so often, I get the opportunity to answer questions and or share comments. And so if you've got a question on the things that we're sharing, don't hesitate to write them in. I may not get to it today, but uh, I will get to it in one of the sessions upcoming. Now, 
Some of you may recall just before we left uh, the country, just before we left for Lagos, Nigeria, and we've just gotten back from the continent of Africa. We were there uh, about 10 days with Pastor Chris, uh, Pastor Benny, and others sharing there. Uh, but just before I left there, I was sharing some, some insights that the Spirit of Grace had begun to give me uh, concerning some things that were transpiring and would be transpiring in the earth. As a matter of fact, I've got a powerful uh, one that I'm going to share with you tomorrow, something I just said, and it just happened, uh, just because you need to understand uh, when the scripture says in Amos chapter 3 and verse 7, God will do nothing except he first revealed his secrets to his servants, the prophets. I, I say this many times. And many times there is an overemphasis of the significance, if you will, of the prophet's function that is beyond what is biblical. But in point of fact, in Amos 3, 7, when the Lord says that, God says that God will do nothing in the earth except he first reveal it to his servants, the prophets. The reality is, again, that God will do nothing in the earth except he work with his word to get it done. The prophet's responsibility is to declare the word of the Lord. And so as the word of God is declared, it releases the spirit of God to do things in the earth. Or as the word of God is declared, it uh, it empowers the people of God to, number one, know what is happening in the earth, and number two, to prepare for what is happening in the earth. Now, just before uh, just before I left the country, the Spirit of the Lord had begun to deal with me about a couple of things, and he had begun to deal with me about famines and shortages that were going to be happening in the earth, and he shared with me uh, that some of those famines, well, well let, let's read, let's go to, to uh, let's go to Matthew chapter 24. Let's go there real quick and let's get into this. I saw somebody just said, you've been waiting for this uh, broadcast, waiting for this time. I've been waiting for it too. And uh, once again, let me encourage you to be with us today and tomorrow. Listen, you don't want to miss what's coming today and tomorrow on the eyes of the watchman. And so uh, I want you to turn to, to Matthew. The gospel is Matthew records it, chapter number 24. Matthew chapter number 24. And I'm going to read uh, at verse number, uh, I'll start reading at verse number three. And once again, I want to remind you that in Matthew chapter 24, where Jesus is dealing with what is commonly referred to as eschatological uh, events or events as relates to the end times, not everything uh, that he deals with here is all concerning the end. Some of these things, because he, he, he he's asked three questions. So let's let's just read verse number one, Genesis 20, I mean, Matthew 24, verse number one. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Now, this was the temple that was in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus's earthly ministry. Uh, came to show him the temple, Herod's temple. Uh, and Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things, meaning all these buildings, all these stones? Surely I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples, his disciplined followers, came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? Now, that first question, when will these things be, refers to what Jesus had just said. He said, do you see all these, these temples, all this stuff? He said, I tell you, not one stone will be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, I've been to that very site in Jerusalem and seen those stones on the ground. They're still there. The stones from Herod's temple, from the destruction that happened 
approximately 70 years after Jesus uttered them, after, 70 years after Jesus uttered those words approximately, that portion of it was fulfilled. Then they ask him, and what will be the sign of your coming? See, that's another question because the destruction of the temple that happened 70 years after Jesus said this and the sign of his coming, those are two different matters uh, separated by thousands of years. So you've got to understand in Matthew 24, Jesus is addressing all of those questions. He's responding to all of them and you've got to know which one he's responding to when. So the second question is, and what will be the sign of your coming? And then the third question is, and what will be the end of the age or aeon? Some translations translate that end of the world, but it's really not end of the world there because the Greek word for world is cosmos. The word here is aeon or ion, depending on your pronunciation, A-I-O-N. And what that means, that word means system or cycle or uh, revolution. In other words, uh, talk about the end of the system or the end of this cycle of time. Now, specifically, that refers to the end of the church age or the end of the age of grace, that is, as, as it is called, the days of grace. The rapture of the church culminates the end of an age, the end of the church age. Now, what is the church age? The church age is that age from, from uh, the ministry, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and seating of Jesus, where the emphasis of the Spirit of God is getting the gospel of Jesus Christ out to all the nations that are not the Jewish nation, to get the gospel out to all the nations that are not of Jewish heritage. And so the church age, are you there? The church age is this age where the emphasis of the Holy Spirit is the preaching of the gospel to the nations of the world, primarily non-Jew. After that is over, there will be an emphasis, a seven year period, according to Daniel in the book of Revelation, where the focus will be on getting the gospel to the Jewish nation and then the one new man that Paul talks about in Ephesians uh, will be complete. That's another conversation for another time. I would urge you to get the series I did on the ends of the ages uh, because it's a very significant and poignant part. It's not what we're dealing with today, but on my way to what we're dealing with, it's important for you to know that because what Jesus begins to talk about are things that are going to happen now as the church age comes to an end, as the age where the gospel being preached to primarily Gentile nations, Gentile means without covenant, meaning non-Jewish. Once you become a Christian, you are no longer a Gentile because Gentile means without covenant. Paul teaches that the nations, we were aliens to the, to the covenants of promise, uh, but once you come to Christ, you're no longer that. Okay, let me, let me not get detracted. Let me stay focused. Okay, here we go. And of the end of the age, verse four, Jesus answered and said, take heed that no one deceives you. He's talking about things that are going to be indications, please hear me, that the age is coming to a close. He says, for many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ or I am the anointed one. It's very interesting. He didn't say many will come saying, I am Jesus. He said, many will come saying, I am Christ. I am an anointed one. I am the anointed one. I am one with the anointed. That's very important. And will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. That's a very important thing. Jesus says, if you're a follower of mine, see that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So wars Rumors of wars, false anointings, false anointings rising up. He said, that's not the key. Uh, you'll see that, but that's not the end yet. He said, for nation, and again, the Greek word there is ethnos, for ethnic group will rise against ethnic group. He's not just talking about nation states. He's talking about great ethnic 
turmoil. And please hear me at the root of what is happening right now, even in Israel and Gaza, it's about ethnic turmoil, not really nation states. I may get into that a little more tomorrow because again, you remember that the Hebrews, the sons of Abraham, and the Arabs, the sons of Ishmael, are cousins. They are both descendants of Abraham. Uh, and so there is an ethnic issue here. For nation will rise against nation, ethnos against ethnos, and kingdom, Basilius, against Basilius. Once again, we're not just talking about uh, King Charles against uh, the king of Saudi Arabia. We're talking here about a clash of rules, of realms, of royalties. That's what the term kingdom means. We're talking about principalities and powers, principles. A kingdom, Basilius, uh, rulers will rise up against rulers. This is happening also in the heavenlies, in principalities and, and other issues. Uh, and he says, and there will be famines. And that's where the spirit of the Lord stopped me. And pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. And when the Lord said something to me about famines, I'm going somewhere with this. When the Lord said, when, when I read the word famines here, it was as if I was arrested by the word famines and the spirit of the Lord said to me, he said, so when I'm speaking of famines, I'm not just talking about several sequential famines because famines have been generational and cyclical. I showed you this before, but he said, when I say famines, plural, he said, I'm talking about different types of famines, not just sequential famines or a famine here, a famine there because of the weather, because of the geology. No, he said, I'm talking about shortages, not only that are actual, but shortages that are manipulated. Famines and shortages that are manipulated. There are actual famines that are due to uh, lack of rain, drought, geological, econ uh, um, geographical, issues. But then he said there are going to be manipulated famines, famines that are manipulated by the activities of men, by the events of men. I showed you one of those manipulated famines in 2 Kings chapter 6. Go there very quickly. And I'm going somewhere with this because this most recent event, and it happened while I was out of the country, but when I heard about it, I was actually on the set, on television, getting ready to preach and minister when I got word of the event that recently happened in Baltimore, Maryland, where the Francis Scott Key Bridge was brought down by a Singaporean uh, tanker, a tanker named the Dolly, uh, a Singaporean tanker. Now, once again, there are a lot of people who are speculating a number of things, and I am not, by my statements here, applying any uh, uh, adverse or negative desire from the nation of Singapore. That's not what I'm talking about. There's something deeper going on here, and I'll deal with that in, in a moment. And when I heard about that, when I heard about this container ship. It wasn't a tanker, but it was a container ship, a, 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 a ship that had supplies and, 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 con, and containers on it. When I heard about this, and I recognized that this, this port in Baltimore is second almost only to the one here in my area of the world in Los Angeles, uh, where the port here has most of the containers and shipping of goods and products from around the world. This one in Baltimore, I believe, is like the second busiest one. And what I learned recently, it's the one most inland uh, to the Midwest and the Eastern Seaboard, which means things that come in there can be dispersed throughout that region. And the Spirit of the Lord began to speak to me about this effect. There's going to be shortage 
and famine caused by this. Now, now, go to 2 Kings chapter number 6. I want to show you a, a, about a manipulated famine, a manipulated shortage. What do you mean, Bishop, by manipulated shortage? Go to 2 Kings chapter 6, uh, verse number 24. 2 Kings 6 and verse number 24. And it says, and it happened after this, that Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was great famine in Samaria. Notice, this famine that happened in Samaria was not a famine of natural element or actual shortage. It was a manipulated shortage, a famine uh, uh, or created or a, a famine that was created or induced by the actions of men. So the shortage was caused by that. What happened is the army of Samaria is besieging and surrounding, the army of Syria rather, is besieging and surrounding the city of Samaria yeah, as with the quarantine, cutting off supply routes and supply chains. This is what caused the famine. It was man-made. Uh, so, so the shortage here was a shortage that cut off supply chains, supply chains. Now watch this. It says uh, there was a great famine in Syria, uh, in Samaria, and they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one fourth of a cap of, drub, of dove droppings for five shekels of silver. So the shortage the result of the shortage was exorbitant and out of control inflation because goods were scarce, prices went up. And I've said it jokingly, but every time I read that, I don't know what you do with a donkey's head, why they were selling them. But the point is, it was way more than it was before the manipulated shortage. And so uh, it happened that the prices went up. And of course, if you read on, you know, the end of the story, it was the word of Elisha, 2 Kings chapter 7. Then Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord tomorrow, about this time, a seah of fine flour will be sold for a shekel and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, look, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And he, that is the prophet, said, in fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat it. So it was a prophetic word that caused the thing to shift. And so I said to all of the righteous, it will be well with the righteous, no matter what shortage, what famine, whether it's actual or manipulated, as you heed the word of the Lord, as you act on the word of the Lord, as you believe God and believe those who speak under divine inspiration with instruction to you, it shall be well. But I am telling you, you are going to need to be connected to the anointing and an anointing in this time and in this season. Now, let me back up. Uh, when I heard, when I heard of this container shift, and when I heard what happened here in this port, uh, the spirit of the Lord began to deal with me immediately. I had said these things about manipulated shortage before I left. But when I heard about it, the Lord began to speak to me about a number of things. And he began to share with me uh, some of the signals and or the indications. Dude, one of the things, oh, children of God, please hear me. One of the things that Jesus said would be happening uh, as, uh, as the end uh, of the age approaches is that there would be signs uh, in the heavens and on earth. Signs, the literally signals. Um, uh, he says this in Matthew 24. He says, for false Christ and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders to deceive even the very elect. So there will be false signs 
But Jesus says in Matthew 16, 3, he said to the uh, to the Pharisees, he says, uh, you can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs. And again, the word there, Greek, simeon, the signals and the indications of the age. So one of the things uh, that has to be understood, Luke 21, verse 11, Jesus says, there will be great earthquakes in various places and famine and pestilence, says, and there will be fearful sights and great signs and or signals. So th th there are going to be indications of things. And um, I'm not suggesting that you and I are to follow signs. We're not. But we are to interpret signals and receive what the Spirit of God is saying. Not, every, not everything has something attached to it. What I heard about this, this container ship, the first witness that I received is this is going to affect shortage. He said there's going to be a shortage as a result of this that will affect the entire eastern seaboard and will ultimately be felt throughout uh, the United States of America. Uh, one of the, uh, the Baltimore AP in reporting about this says the ship struck one of the bridge's supports causing the structure to collapse. Get it. It struck one of the uh, bridges support. And when I read that, the support system uh, began to crumble and the structure began to collapse like a toy. This is from uh, PBS.org uh, reporting on it. Uh, they, they also reported here on Wednesday, April the 3rd, it says the collapse is sure to create a logistical nightmare for months, if not years, along the East Coast, shutting down ship traffic at the port of Baltimore, a major shipping hub. The accident will also snarl uh, cargo and commuter traffic. Um, uh, one uh, uh, one of the other reports asked what um, what role does this port in Baltimore play? It says along with being the top U.S. port for automobiles, Baltimore is also the nation's furthest inland port. Uh, said Houston Mason, adjunct professor of supply chain management at Loyola and Georgetown universities. So what's going to happen here is uh, it's going to affect the supply chain. They're talking about automobiles, other things on the eastern seaboard into the Midwest, which will ultimately uh, affect the entire nation. Um, they're asking how long will shipping be suspended? It says at the moment, experts predict it will take at least a couple of months to clear wreckage from the crashed cargo ship and, and the bridge from the harbor, uh, effectively preventing all maritime traffic coming or going out during that period. Uh, the New York Post reported um, on Wednesday, April 3rd, the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge effectively shut down operations at the port of Baltimore, affecting about 8,000 jobs and about $2 million in wages. Between $100 million and $200 million worth of trade passes through that port every day. Did you hear that? Between $100 million and $200 million worth of trade passes through that port every single day. Now, when I heard about this happening, the spirit of the Lord began to minister to me. Now, let me first of all, once again, say it shall be well with the righteous. 
And if you're connected to this anointing, I promise you, you are going onward and upward from here. Uh, but you're going to have to understand what is happening in the season, in the cycle. You're going to have to lock into the word of God as he speaks to you and the prophetic words and the men and women of God that he sends to you with his word. This is going to be uh, this is going to be one of the greatest times of witness or evidence. See, Jesus said that this gospel of the kingdom, not just the gospel of salvation, salvation is the foundational element of this gospel. You must be born again or born from above. But Jesus said the key that is going to witness the end or the evidence of the end is, and this gospel of the kingdom. Notice, he didn't just say this gospel. He didn't just say any kind of presentation. This gospel of the kingdom. What is that? This gospel of the Basilius. This gospel of the rule of God. This gospel of the expanse of the realm. The word Basilius means rule, realm, and royal, royalty. This gospel of the rule and the dominion of Jesus and his principles, his words, and his, in other words, this gospel that demonstrates that what God's word has said rules everything, takes dominion over everything. This gospel of the realm, the, again, the realm of a sovereign is the territory over which the sovereign presides. So the gospel of the kingdom is this gospel that demonstrates the expanse of the rule of the Lord Jesus, the expanse of the power of his word, not just to save the soul and take it to heaven, but to prosper the man or woman of God who stands on it, to prosper their business, to protect their family. This gospel that empowers them in the midst of famine and pestilence and sickness to stand on the word of God and be well when everybody else is going sick. He, this gospel of the kingdom, again, royalty. The key to royalty is protocol and principle. That's what makes a kingdom royal, is its protocol, is its principle. When you see it, the pomp, the circumstance, the way in which, hear it, the way in which the business of that kingdom is conducted, that's the royalty of a kingdom. Thank you, master. The way in which the principles of that kingdom uh, are conveyed. That's the royalty. And that's what that word kingdom means. So he says this gospel of the kingdom, watch this, watch it, shall be preached as a witness. He didn't say it would be witness. He didn't say everybody would get witness too. No, he said this gospel of the overthrow, of the rule, of the dominion, of the expansion of the realm, of the superiority of the principles of this Jesus of Nazareth and his people. This gospel that of, of the kingdom will be preached as a witness. Again, the Greek word there is marturion, which means one who is able to produce evidence. The a martyr is not a martyr because they die. It's not what makes them a martyr. A martyr is a martyr because their death is the evidence that what they believed they were unwilling to turn loose of. And rather than turn loose of what they believe, they would die. So they are ones who produce evidence. That's what the word marturion means. So this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world and it will be evidenced. That's what this means. The gospel will be evidenced, not just talked about. It'll be manifested as superior. So even in times of famine, Glory be to God. I am telling you in the name of Jesus, the superiority of your God, the superiority of the principles by which you and I govern ourselves are going to be demonstrated. Now, the spirit of the Lord, he, he began to which, sorry, I got the, the, the preach came on me there. The prophecy started coming out of me. Let me get to a couple of practical things here and I'll pick this up. And ended tomorrow when I heard the Francis Scott Key.
Yankee Bridge in Baltimore. Again, the East Coast. Remember, this is the coast where our liberty, the liberty of this nation, uh, uh, was, was initiated, where the revolution that caused this nation to come into its independence. Uh, this is the region from which this was initiated. The Francis Scott Key Bridge, again, Francis Scott Key is the individual who penned the Star Spangled Banner, this nation's national anthem. The Star Spangled Banner is about the flag of this nation prevailing, you know, and the rocket's red glare and the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. He wrote those words in that very harbor. Right in eyeshot of that bridge, those words were penned by Francis Scott Key. The national anthem, oh God, the national anthem that we all learned and sung coming up, the national anthem that has been questioned as to whether we should stand or kneel for it based on ethnic difference and other types of things, not minimizing nor negating the validity of those concerns. I'm speaking as a prophet of God. I'm speaking into things much larger than that. See, the flag and that anthem, the flag is a symbol of national pride. And the rockets, red glare, the bombs gave proof through the night that a flag, oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave <laughs> over the land of the free and the home of the brave. The flag is an icon. It is a symbol. It is an initiator of national pride. So when the Francis Scott Key Bridge came down, when the, when the structures that held the bridge up were hit and caused the structure to collapse, the word of the Lord came to me and said, this is a season where the pride of this nation is about to be brought down. The pride of the nation is about to be challenged. It is about to be significantly affected. Now, where is a nation's pride? Amongst the community of nations, a nation's pride is in its economic prowess and its riches. He that has ears to hear, let him hear. That's why these the World Economic Forum in Davos, God help us. That's why, uh, you, you know, the, the, the great eight nations, the economic powers and nuclear powers of the world, that's why they meet. Why? Because the pride of a nation is in its economic prowess and its riches. It's in its gross uh, national product, its GDP. So when the Francis Scott Key Bridge, the man who wrote the national anthem about the flag, when that got hit and came down, the spirit of the Lord said to me, America is about to be humbled amongst the nations. There is about to be an economic uh, collapse in certain areas. There will be shortage. Uh, there will be, sh some of it will be manipulated again. And there are powers that are going to take advantage of the manipulation and raise prices to exorbitant degrees. Hear me by the spirit. The government is going to have to get involved in some of this to make sure that prices are regulated because things are going to be gouged, but it shall be well with the righteous. Now, what did I hear? The fact that this is coming together at the same time that the United States is being challenged in its relationship. Don't miss what I'm about to say. At the same time that the United States is being challenged in its relationship with Israel through the Hamas-Israel war through this conflict that is happening there. 
and many in the United States are siding with the Palestinians against Israel. And once again, I'm not going to get into a discussion about that. If you want to have it, I'll have it. Uh, but I'm going to take you to the word of God with it, not just your historical opinion. Certainly, we want peace amongst the Israel Israelis and the Palestinians. We want no shortage or cutting short of life there. We want peace. However, there is a historical biblical right that the seed of Abraham according to the faith of Abraham, have to that land. Now, why is this important? Why is this important? And I'll get into that more significantly. What is the connection between this Francis Scott Key Bridge coming down and that? Once again, it's the pride of a nation. The pride of a nation is in its economic stability, its riches amongst the community of nations. Why is this important? The greatest era of prosperity in the United States of America began after 1948. 1948, when Israel became a nation again, and President Harry Truman stood with Israel and its occupation of that area becoming a state again, a nation state. President Harry Truman, after World War II, was one of the first presidents. I wasn't alive then, okay? But do your history. Read your history. Study it. He was one of the first national global leaders to side with the nation of Israel and their right to exist as a nation state on that land, going all the way back to God's covenant with Abraham, who according to Romans is the father of us all in the presence of God who believe. All us who believe, Abraham is the father of us all, Jew and Christian in the presence of God. That's in your Bible, sir. That's in your Bible, ma'am. And so it was when President Harry Truman sided with the nation of Israel, that began the greatest upsurge of American prosperity in the history of this nation. It was that that caused the latter part of the 20th century to become known as the American century because America became the greatest financial, economic, uh, maritime, and uh, political, as well as military power on planet Earth. Before that, it was primarily Great Britain for the same reasons, because there are two reasons that nations have had the favor and the blessing of God. One is their commitment to the Israel of God, and number two is their commitment to the evangelism of the nations of the world. That was at one time Great Britain. Before the war, it was Great Britain. After the war, it shifted to the United States of America. And hear me very well. If America does not make certain decisions in the next years, that power will shift to another nation and perhaps to the continent of Africa. Now, hear me very well. Hear me. See, the, 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 the American pride, the pride of this nation that Americans have inherited just by being Americans, we have thought, we have thought that our blessing, our prosperity, our favor has been just because we're Americans. No, no, no. It has not been because we're Americans. It has been because we kept the fundamental principle of the covenant God made with Abraham. It's recorded in Genesis chapter 12. Go back there right now, Genesis chapter 12. Are you getting anything out of this? If you are tracking me, just write down right now, shout out at me, say, I'm tracking you, Bishop. Let me know that you are hearing what the man of God is saying. Now, we got to drill down deeper into this. I'm going to drill down a little deeper tomorrow, but I need you to hear this today. If you're tracking me, 
shout out at me, say, I'm tracking you, Bishop. It doesn't matter whether you agree with me or not. It's whether you're hearing me. Are you tracking me? All right, there's Donna saying she's tracking. Anybody, let me see. say on, Bishop Anthony. Okay, Anthony's with me. He's tracking. I'm tracking you, Bishop. Thank you, Kenneth. I see you, my brother. Here's Siobhan. I'm tracking with you, Bishop. Thank you, Siobhan. Kathy says, I'm tracking you, Bishop. All right. Who else? Who else? Give me three more. I, give me three more. Deb, I'm tracking you, Bishop. Two more. Let me see. Here's Jose. I'm tracking you. Let me get one more. I want to know that you're hearing one. Okay, there's Justin tracking. Thank you. Okay, now watch this. Gen uh, Genesis chapter 12. Yeah. Genesis chapter 12. When God makes covenant with Abram, when he, when he meets him, this is before he makes covenant, but this is the promise he makes, he makes with him. See, and he's heir, and we're heirs according to Galatians 3, according to this promise. Boy, that's a whole nother thing I need to teach. See, we're not heirs according to the law. We're heirs according to the promise. This is the promise. This is what we inherited. Watch this. Now, the Lord said to Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house to a land I will show you. Here it is. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. Watch this. Verse number three. I will bless those who bless you. That word bless there literally means empower to prosper. I will empower to prosper those who empower your prosperity. If you, are you there? God, not Clarence, not any American president. God made the descendants of Abraham a point of decision for the nations of the earth. Did you hear what I just said? God did it. He said, anyone who empowers your prosperity, I will empower them to prosper. And anyone, and I will curse him who curses you. That word curse there means to have the disregard of with respect to the blessing. I will disregard them with respect to the blessing. Now remember, the blessing has to do with favor, prosperity, protection. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him. I will disregard with respect to the blessing those who disregard you with respect to the blessing. And in you, all the families, mishpacha in Hebrew, which literally means those in your class, not upper class, lower class, but but like, uh, like uh, university class, those who have learned to function like I taught you to function. That's what it means to be in the family of Abraham. Glory be to God forever. Uh. See, that's why the Bible says those that are of the faith of Abraham. These are the seeds. These are the seed of Abraham. Not those who are of the flesh of Abraham. Those who are of the faith of Abraham. And that is the distinction between the nation state of Israel and the Israel of God, which the Bible speaks about. Now, the nation state of Israel is protected because the Israel of God is in it. Uh, but God is not favoring the nation state of Israel. God is favoring the Israel of God, those who are of the faith of Abraham. And because that Hub is there in what is called Israel. According to the nations of the earth, it has God's divine protection. And Yeshua will protect it in his coming. Uh, don't want to get into that. So, so watch this. So, so, so watch this. So, so when President Harry Truman in 1948 caused America to be the first nation to bless the seed of Abraham. God put a blessing on this nation. The baby boom began. What is the prosperity of a nation? What is one of its key indications? It is in the production of offspring. That's one of the, that's one of the blessings that God gave. He told Abraham, your seed will be 
as the sands of the seashore. I'm going to multiply them. That was one of the things that caused the Egyptians to try to oppress the children of Israel when uh, Joseph and his crew went down there because they were reproducing too fast. Why? Because the birthing of children is a part of a signal of the blessing. It was after 1948, the baby boom generation began. The greatest economic season of American prosperity began, the industrial revolution. All of these things that occurred in this nation proliferated after 1948. And most of us who are alive today are the inheritors of that season of prosperity. So we think we're blessed because we're Americans. No, we are blessed because of the posture and the position this nation was placed in by leaders who had a sense of the Judeo-Christian ethic and, and its principles rooted in scripture. Now, for the first time, we have a generation of national political leaders and unfortunately, even religious leaders who are not grounded in the Judeo-Christian ethic in their upbringing. They have no understanding of the historical posture of the scripture as relates to the seed of Abraham and things are being threatened. So when I heard, when I heard about this and when I recognized the convergence of these two things, I said, number one, the people of God must know and understand and now we must pray like never before. Oh, there's so much to this. Go with me to Psalm 9. Psalm 9, verse 17. Psalm 9. Are you getting this? Psalm 9 and verse 17. Uh, uh, Lord Jesus, let me get through this. I'm trying to go too fast. I've got tomorrow, so I'll pick up some tomorrow because I've got about 10 minutes here. Psalm 9 and verse 17 says, The wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, there is something that happens when a nation forgets God. I've said this before. See, America was never as righteous as she portrayed herself to be. She's never been as flawless as she has portrayed herself to be. The things that are happening in this nation have always been happening in it. Crime, uh, political corruption, uh, homosexual and lesbian liberty. All of that has always been going on in this nation. It was not as pronounced. You didn't have 24 hour this, 24 hour that, cable, internet, uh, Instagram, uh, all these ways to get information. But the stuff has always been happening. The difference was there was a time when America acknowledged God. In the midst of all the negativity in the midst of its failures, in the midst of its iniquities, in the midst of its perversions. None of this is new, yet it acknowledged God. It called upon the Lord. I was talking in our service here at the place of Grace Cosmopolitan Center. I believe it was in our prayer time here just a few days ago when I, when I was watching I was led by the Spirit of God to watch uh, a, a documentary on Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I was watching it to the degree that I, I don't even know why I was watching it. I was captured by it. I, I'm, a, I'm a student of history. I love history. I love to study it. Uh, I, I like to, you know, to watch things that are documentaries of true historical events. Uh, but for some reason, I was drawn to this. And for several like episodes, I'm, I, I found myself saying that, God, why am I, why am I even watching this? I couldn't get away from it. Then I got to the point where just before the D-Day invasion, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the president of the United States at that time, he would do these things called fireside chats. Again, I wasn't alive then, but I've learned this through history. He would do fireside chats. There wasn't television at the time. So the nation was connected by radio and communication. And he used these fireside chats throughout his presidency, the New Deal and all that, to communicate and get the nation on his side. And before the D-Day invasion, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt in one of his fireside chats, and I saw this in this documentary, and when I watched it 
tears began coming down my eyes right there in my home where he led the nation, the president of the United States led the nation in prayer for the army as it was beginning to uh, embark upon its entrance into Europe in World War II. And I thought to myself, what would happen today if an American president got on TV and said, I'm going to lead the nation in prayer and calling upon God? The, the LGB alphabet people would come at him. The, these people would come. Everybody would come. Funding would be uh, because we're scared to remember God in the midst of this nation. And God give us political leaders, give us presidents, give us senators, give us congressmen, give us governors, give us mayors that will not be ashamed to call on the name of the Lord and lead a nation that has forgotten God back to calling upon his name. See, I'm not talking about imposing Christianity on everybody. No, 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 no. I'm not talking about national religion. And I'm not talking about this false separation of church and state, which is a historical lie. Don't ever come at me with that madness. The, 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 the statute says Congress shall pass no law uh, uh, affirming an institution of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. It is not a separation of church and state. It is a separation of state from church. Congress shall pass no law respecting an institution of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That's the statement. It's not that the church is to stay out of the state. It's the state is to stay out of the church. It's not a separation of church and state. It's a separation of state from church. One of the foundations of this nation was religious liberty and not having a government imposed. So I'm not talking about making Christianity a national religion, but we are now in a nation where you can't even call on the name of the Lord in public without being lamb blasted and attacked. That devil is a liar. And that's one of the reasons this nation is about to face a confrontation with its pride because it has believed that we are prospering because we are Americans. Go to Psalm 38. Psalm 38, verse number 12. Psalm 38 and verse number 12. Ooh, is that what I want? I'm sorry, Psalm 33. Psalm 33 and verse number 12. I, I said the wrong thing. My bad. Psalm 33 and verse number 12. Watch this. Blessed is that nation empowered to prosper. <laughs> One of the Greek words for blessed is the word benedicteo. Benedicteo from which we get our word benediction, which is what is done at the conclusion of a service. It's the pronouncement of conclusion. So one of the other things that blessing means is the pronouncement of conclusion. You see, God has certain conclusions to things. He's already written how it's supposed to end up. No matter what comes against you, no matter what happens, no matter how the enemy comes against you, God has already determined you're supposed to win. So one of the things that blessed means, in addition to empowered to prosper, is, is uh, being the recipient of divine conclusions. Are you there? Blessed is that nation. The recipients of divine conclusions is that nation whose God is the Lord. That nation whose God is the right God, the Lord. The people he has chosen as his own inheritance. Go to Proverbs 16, verse number 18. I'm getting ready to pray. I've got about three minutes. Proverbs 16, verse number 18. Proverbs, are, did you get, are you getting anything? Proverbs 16, verse number 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, I've got to read something to you in Matthew 25. Go to Matthew 25, verse 31, and I'll pick up here whew, tomorrow. Matthew 21. Verse Matthew 25, verse number 31. 
when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. Watch this. All nations will be gathered before him. And he will separate them from one another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you blessed, uh, come you empowered to prosper by or of my father. Inherit the kingdom, prepare for you for the foundation of the world. I want you to see this. This, this sheep and goats are nations. Na so, so what is going to happen at, as the end of the age approaches there are going to be a division of nations. There will be sheep nations and goat nations. Are you listening to me? See, we thought this just is about individuals, sheep and goat. No, no, no. He's talking about nations. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, come you empowered to come you nations that have been empowered to prosper by my father. Yeah, and inherit, I feel the Holy Ghost, and inherit the kingdom. So there are nations that are going to be coming into kingdom power and authority because they stood with God and his purposes at the end of the age. For I was hungry, and you, as a nation, fed me. You, as a nation... <laughs> I was hungry, and you as a nation, are you listening? I was hungry, and you as a nation gave me food. I was thirsty, and you as a nation gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you as a nation took me in. I was naked, and you as a nation clothed me. I was sick, and you as a nation visited me. I was in prison, and you as a nation came to me. And he said, well, when did we do this? He said, in as much as you did it to the least of these, my brethren. I want you to get that. He's, he's, he's not saying, I, we, we quote everything wrong. That in as much as you did it to the least of these, my brethren. He's not calling the ones who did it his brethren. He's saying, when you supported my brethren, when you stood for the principles of the kingdom in the face of adversity, when you as a nation didn't compromise and you continued to support my brethren, you did it to me. Are you there? I'm running out of time. Listen to me. The spirit of the Lord said to me, oh, he witnessed to me. Let me not, because it wasn't thus said the Lord. The spirit of the Lord ministered this in my spirit so clearly over several days. He said, son, that bridge coming down is a signal I'm about to deal with the pride of the American nation. And that pride in is going to hit its economy, not just in a, a, a breakdown like on Wall Street, but on Main Street. Stores are going to be empty. Shelves are going to be empty. Things that people have counted on, they're going to be unable to get, but it will be well with the righteous. Now, I want you to hear me. And I want you to hear me very clearly. I believe with all of my spirit, without fear of contradiction, I've got more than enough to do. I preach nine times in six or seven days. I, I traveled thousands of miles. I told the Lord, I said, God, I need some rest. He said, you do what I tell you. And I will renew your body and I will keep you well in strong. I need a couple of days of rest, but I have not been able to stop because I am compelled by the spirit of God to say what I'm saying. Now, I am not done. I'm going to share something with you tomorrow. When you see it, it's, it, it, it's going to be amazingly confirming to the fact that the spirit of God is dealing with you and I together now in these moments. And I am telling you by the spirit of God, like Elijah was sent to the widow woman of Zarephath in famine, like Elisha was sent to the woman when she was in shortage 
and in need, and they were coming to take her sons as a prophet of God. God is sending me to men and women in this season, in this time, number one, to prepare you, and number two, to prophetically declare to you, it shall be well with the righteous. It shall be well with you and your house. The Bible said, Jesus said it. Clarence didn't say it. He said there were many widows in Zarephath in the time of Elisha the prophet, but he was only sent to one, and the one he was sent to was the one that was sustained. I am telling you, if I'm not sent to anybody else, I'm sent to you. And I am declaring you and your household, your ministry, your family, your business, your enterprise is going to do well. Now, here's what I want you to do. And I want you to do it now. I want you to get ready to sow into this anointing and sow into this work. There is so much in the next several months God is speaking to us to do. And I am not going to stop until I get it all done. And I need your prayers and I need you to help undergird. I'm not in need. God is blessing us. But I am telling you by the spirit of grace, there's more to do. And as long as I'm hearing from God, saying what he's telling me to say, I'm not going to stop what the spirit of grace is telling me to declare. The spirit of God has been speaking to me all throughout this last several months about the seed that is to be sown, that through this cycle, through this season, it's going to be well with you. I want many of you today to get ready and sow the dedication seed. That over this next 12-month period, 12 months from when you're hearing this, the blessing and favor of God, this is God's assurance to me that it's going to be well with you. There's about four or five of you listening to me right now. One of you is a pastor. There's another one of you, you're a business person. I see you actually in some degree of, of business as relates to farming or agriculture. I don't know if it's about the ground, but the equipment. And the Spirit of God is dealing with me to minister to you right now and to tell you that you are one of these. There's about four or five that are to sow that $1,200 seed into this anointing, into this moment. And the Spirit of God has declared to me that those who will connect with this anointing in this season, he told me to ask for this seed all this year because there's a cycle and a season and a system that is going to cause a dedication. It's a dedication seed that literally you and your stuff are being dedicated to God in this season. See, and the apostle said, I know in whom I have believed, and I know that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. This seed is one of those things that is your declaration, your witness to God. I'm committing this to you, and I'm believing you to keep it. Did you hear what I just said? Now, that's not for everybody. There's only four or five. There's over almost two, 300 people listening to me right now just on this and, and a thousand or so more on the other mediums that we're talking through right this moment and thousands more will hear it. I want every one of you to get the very best seed that you can and sow it into this anointing today. If you can meet me at a $70 seed, do it because there is an impartation flowing by the spirit of grace. And I'm going to pray for you in just a moment. I'm going to pray for you in just a moment, but I want you right this moment to get ready to sow. You can go to bishopmcclendon.com. You can sow that way right there on your computer screen, right there on your smartphone. There's a donate button. There's a way for you to sow. Somebody said, Bishop, why do you always ask for people to sow? Because I know how this anointing, this grace on my life works. I am anointed to help connect people to the power of of God. Now, that's not everybody. There's somebody here. There's Deborah sowing a seed, $120 a month to get to that $1,200. Thank you. You can do it over a, a year's period. You can sow on it every month. But if that is you and the Spirit of God is witnessing it to you, you need to do it. Now, everybody else, everybody else, there's some of you say, you know what, prophet, I would do that, but that's not my level of giving. I want you to sow a $120 seed. That's 10 uh, dollars over 12 months. 1200 is is $100 over 12 months. Different levels of faith, different level of believing. See, listen, uh, you know, there's a certain level of faith you get to. I remember when sowing $10 was faith for me. I remember when sowing $100 was an act of faith for me. It just isn't anymore. 
because God has blessed me. And when you get up into the thousand, twelve hundred, that's still faith for me. Ten thousand, still faith for me. Fifty thousand, still faith for me. I've sold them all. Not bragging. There was a time I couldn't sow five cents. God increases you. But if God is speaking, oh, I sense the Holy Ghost. There's somebody, your seed today is going to break you into a place where you'll never lack anything you have need of. I remember when that happened to me. I remember when it happened to me. Glory to God. And you'll never again be without seed. I want that you say, Bishop McClendon, I'm not one of those. If you can, if you can meet me at a $70 seed, that impartation seed, do it. And if you're not one of those, then you just give the very best you can. The Bible says, if there first be a willing heart, it is accepted, not according to what a man has not, but according to what he has. So I'm about to pray for you. Don't miss tomorrow. Whatever you do, don't miss it. There are some things I got to share with you and have to show you that are going to be transformation. The Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray for my brother. I pray for my sister. I pray for this pastor, this businessman, this entrepreneur, these right now that are hearing your word and acting upon it. My Father, in the name of Jesus, I declare no season of shortage in their lives. And I decree the blessing of the Lord continue to rest upon the Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray for the nations of the earth. I am sent to the nations, but I pray for my own nation, the United States of America, that you would have mercy upon her in this day. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, amen and amen. Now, if you've got a prayer request, Call the number 310-323-2600. You can also sow that way. You can text give C-E-M-M to 41444. I'm going to say that again. You can text give right now. Just text C-E-M-M to 41444. Just follow the prompts and give as God has directed you. You can call the number 310-323-2600. If you've got the Bishop McClendon app, you can give that way. You can download it from Google or iTunes. You should do that anyway and just stay connected. But however you choose to do it, do it in faith. Do it believing. This is the prophet of God, Bishop McClendon. I'll be back tomorrow with the eyes of the watchman. Be blessed.